I'm playing snare drum at that time. That people don't believe that. I didn't. I didn't play trombone at that time. That's probably sixth grade. I hit the drum head so hard that it broke, and they couldn't afford to buy another le another leather Radio King head for it. So that was the end of my drumming. I was good at it. They, uh, he, he, he said I, he was watching that he was playing trombone. He played cornet, but he helped them out once in a while on trombone. And he was, he, had this, he was washing this thing in the tub, washing it out. And I said, I'm going to try that. So I said, what do you mean? I said, because I'd, I'd been through piano, tr cornet, uh, euphonium, and then this trombone thing. And he said, well, if you play this, you're going to stick with it. Because he had enough of me changing my mind. I mean, this all started when I was in sixth grade. So... I picked it up and I liked it right away. It was one of those, I liked the sloshy noise it made in the tub and everything else, so. That's by the day I re-enlisted. And if, if you've read the book, you know what happened. That, that day I re I walked down the steps, that guy, there's a, a full bird colonel, and he, he uh, tells my parents and grandparents, tells me to leave them. And uh, I get down the steps. This is at the Philadelphia Navy Yard where I went to re-enlist. And I walk down there. There's about maybe a dozen kids, maybe not quite as young, but, you know, they're 18, 19-year-old people. And they're all going to Paris Island. The bus is there. It's, the diesel's running and everything else. And, and this, I, I don't know whether the guy was, what, what rank he was, but he said, uh, you just enlisted? I said, Yes, and he said, well, he said, get your bag, and where is it? I said, what bag? I don't remember, I don't remember this word for word. And he said, well, you get in the bus. He said, you're going to go into basic. I said, I'm not. And he said, yeah, you are. He said, did you enlist? I said, yes. He said, did you put your right hand up? I said, yeah. He said, yes, yeah. I said, I said yeah. <laughs> and just at that point, these they walked down. And they walk out. It was an old wooden building, very much like if you see the Indian down Gap, some of those old buildings there. It was two story. And that guy asks this guy, a sergeant or whatever he was, they called him Gunny. He just said, uh, I'm having a problem. He said, This young man just enlisted, sir. He said, He doesn't want to go on the bus. And, 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 he's, and it was interesting to see the expression on this guy's face because he says, Oh, he, he's not going to go with them. He's, he's going down to Washington, D.C. He's going to the president's own. The guy says, The who? <laughs> Tours would go for uh, 63 days, no more, no less, except for 1959. We did a 67-day a, uh, tour. We played all the Marine Corps bases out west, uh, just three of them, but uh, uh, four of them. And, uh, but that's how the publicity would go out. You're playing, you're playing two concerts a day, uh, a matinee, which is uh, an hour and 10 minutes long, usually. And then you have a two-hour concert at night. And I did 57 and 58 uh, at, uh, in, the, in the matinees at 17. And then the, the next, after that, it was nighttime. That's, that's when the pressure was down. That's when you worked for the, for the boss. It was some Mexican play thing. And it was a key V. That's a trombone solo in it. And when we're driving back that after that gig, this is my first one. This is the Sinatra thing. But the, after that first gig, why Jim King, this assistant leader who had the job that night, came, comes up to the bus seat and says, "Jimmy," he says, "What key were you playing in when you played that?" I said, "I don't know." He said, "You know?" He said, "It's four sharps." I said. Huh? He said, you didn't play one.
and I'm sitting there while he's working with the reeds. I, I look over to Don Bechtel and I said, Mr. Bechtel, I said, what's that? And he said, what's what? And I said, that. And he didn't understand, so I finally point on it. And he said, that. I said, yeah, that, that's not a bass clef. He said, no, that's a tenor clef. I said, a t what's a tenor clef? <laughs> <laughs> so he tells me, and he said, well, your second space C is now read on the fourth line. I said, no, it's not. He said, now it is. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, uh, well, they moved me up next to him after my very first year there. Uh, he, uh, he put his hand on my knee and he just said, Laddie, just listen. And he uh, and I know exactly what he's talking about. That's that's the lesson well learned. learned. Uh, that's at the White House. That's just uh, we we play Christmas uh, quartets, uh, and uh, they had. Uh, uh, an accordion in one room, had the quartet playing there, had the string orchestra playing someplace else, had a piano player playing in the lobby. Uh, Christmas is quite something there uh, every year. Uh, it, I don't think it's changed. They wonder, how do, how do you rehearse for things like this? Well, uh, Frank Sinatra is a perfect example. Nelson Riddle came in in the morning. We start rehearsals at 10 o'clock. Always used to start at 8.45, but when they had that stuff going. You, you know about a week or two ahead that you were doing a gig. You didn't know who was going to be in the gig yet. And you didn't get the music. You only saw the music on, uh, for instance, let's just say, today, tonight's the gig. You saw the music this morning at 10 o'clock. And then you read it through with, with their conductor, not ours. Uh, Nelson Riddle directed this one. And I, I don't know of any conductor that was not great. I mean, uh, uh, and 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 understood what he was working. He's he was working with pros. They don't come up to you and slap you in the back and have conversations with you. They acknowledge your presence. Uh, and uh, if they'll walk by you, they might smile or say, hi, guys, or something like that. Uh, the only time I ever had a conversation with anybody like that was uh, uh, Kennedy walked by one day. They were, doing a, they were having a, a great big thing, and a military thing on, on the White House lawn. And I, in fact, I don't know when I can remember where we had another one that was involving all the military. Uh, and it was, I, I, think, I don't know if he was bringing Haile Selassie in or who it was, but it was a rehearsal for it. And it was probably about 90 degrees. And uh, we were in, in, in full dress because we were going to be there the whole day and evening. Uh, and it was the full band that time. It, was very, it wasn't just an orchestra. But uh, Kennedy walked by and, of course, being in the end of the trombone, so he just looked back and he says, Hot enough for you? <laughs> I did that said, I said, I, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> he said, I don't blame you. I don't want to be here. <laughs> I mean, they, I think they get tired of the drudgery, the, 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 the formality of it all. That's Kennedy. I find that photo fascinating because you can see how painful, how much pain he's in when he stooped forward. He couldn't stand straight. So we get this job at the Depart Benno Auditorium. And the funny thing about it is, he, Kennedy is a junior senator. And Nixon is there, too. And they come in at two different times, and they sit in the dais. And Kennedy is sitting there waiting for his introduction and what he's going to say. And he reaches into his pocket, and he pulls out these six white cards. And he gets a pencil out of a pen, a pen, a pen out of his jacket, out of his suit coat, and he starts writing one-liners. And he, after each one, he's like, mm, 
You, you can see he's smirking. He's, he's getting a kick out of something. So his turn comes to talk, and he rips off these six one-liners, and the audience just loves it. And he'd say something, and they just roar. Because he was a natural comedian, uh, just the way he spoke. Chopper, oh, that's that's the that's the boss, and wait, but he, Chopper's the one in the, the he, he's that's right here. He's dancing with his wife, and then next to John, Lyndon Johnson and, and, and Lady Bird. Lady Bird was nice, but she was kind of nuts. <laughs> he turns around, he sees me, he turns back to the reed section, and abruptly turns right around, and says, "You sit like that at home." And I said, "No, no, what?" And I said, no. He said, sir. I said, sir. He turns around and works for the clarinets again. Turns around abruptly again and says, why are you sitting there? See, I had, I had my leg up in the chair. That's what didn't do me. That's what did me in. And I said, why are you sitting there? I said, uh, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't have a uniform. He said, the uniform doesn't play. Got your horn. And in the book, I think I wrote down there, thank God I, got my, I had my horn to come and sit to have the horn with me. So I walk up on stage, and he lets me alone then. But he'd be out there in the, in the matinee crowd, standing in the back, listening to everything. And if you missed a note, he'd let you know. And you can count in one, one hand the number of notes you missed. I mean, you, you just didn't miss notes back then. You don't miss them today. He walks into my hospital. I've just had brain surgery. He walks into my hospital room. And I almost fell out of bed. I said, what the hell are you doing here? He said, you're my boy. I had to come see you. He was there for two minutes. The nurse walks in and says, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Urban. Uh, I just was coming and let you know it's time for your, your, your uh, uh, physical therapy. And he says, you take care of him. And I said, she said, no, you, you can stay. He says, I drove up. I can drive back. He was there less than two minutes. Came over, gave me a hug, and came back, went back. Thank you.